Very nice. So you this okay? meeting is being recorded. Sorry. Oh, you don't have to stop chatting. I can cut that part off. <laughs> <laughs> the conversation ends right there. No. We're recorded, so Laurel, we have to be careful what we say, right? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> it was even worse when I was at Dartmouth. They recorded the lectures, but the camera would start recording automatically, like three minutes before the lecture start time. So anybody who is up standing in front of the podium, you know, fiddling with stuff, getting ready, asking questions before class, that would show up on the recording unless you went in and edited it off. <laughs> I'm sorry, I wasn't able to be in class because of... <laughs> Hey, let's just step over here. Um, it's great to see you all this morning. It's fun to see pe people that I know from so many different places and things all together in the same Zoom room. It's also great to have Shyam here with us this morning. Um, he'll be talking about his new tool, um, Kugu, and it's a way of training your own machine learning models from data that you have in hand. So I know there's been a lot of interest in this session I have the recording running um, for a few people to be able to watch later. Um, but Jam, I will turn it over to you. Thanks again for taking the time to come out. Today, you should have screen sharing permissions as co-host. Let me know if you need anything on the technical side. Let me try. Right. Are you guys able to see this? That looks good. We're seeing the PowerPoint. Okay, and now we're seeing, seeing okay. slides. Great. All right. So, um, as Laurel said, um, you know, it'll be an introduction to this um, software package that we've developed in house. It's called Kugu. Um, yeah, we will get through um, the the, the uh, um, kinks of walking through that. But before that, I'll just give a um, you know very brief introduction to um, machine learning for the for folks that you know haven't played around with this yet. Um, so you know you you've come across the buzz, uh, the buzzwords these days, deep neural networks. Um, one of the most popular ones that we use um, in the industry is uh, what's called convolutional neural networks. Um, and what it does is basically take um, an image um, and take a tiny filter and you know convolve that across um, left, right, top down um, and get some outputs. Um, basically a convolutional neural network has a stack of these, um, you know, working at different layers, extracting different features at different um, depths. Um, you can think of the first layer as extracting um, edges and ridges and, you know, intensity gradients and things like that. Subsequent layers, you know, if you're looking at, um, say, a face detection algorithm, um, you can think of the second or the third layers as basically looking at, um, you know, characteristic features that define a face, like edges of your uh, chin, you know, where your eyes sit, and subsequent layers um, eventually putting them together to say, you know, yes, this... Uh, represents a face, basically. Um, um, so most of the things that we do with bioacoustics kind of draws um, from the success uh, that computer vision industry has seen in convolutional networks. Um, I'll just point out there are other options available as well, um, other deep neural networks. The first one being the recurrent neural network. Um, there are a few flavors um, available. Most of these are typically used in um, um, things that require temporal modeling um, in cases such as um, weather prediction or stock market forecasting, things like that. Um, then comes the GANs. Um, if you've heard of the buzzwords, um, uh, deep fakes and things like that, that's GANs are basically what drives them. So there's, um, it, it's made up of two, um, um, two model space, essentially one has learned um, a really good way to fake things. The second one is basically has figured out a way to tell whether things are fake or not. So they both co-evolve um, basically. Um, so moving on, so transformers is something that's new, that's kind of taken the uh, natural language processing world by storm. Um, it is used, it's used in, predominantly used in things like, you know, text um, language conversion on the fly basically. Um, so there are many more, um, but again, we'll shift our focus back to CNNs. Um, as I said, you know, it, CNNs have ruled the roost in computer vision for many years, and it continues to do so. There's um, very much active ongoing development. There are um, very attractive architectures being developed in all the time, basically. Um, how does this apply to bioacoustics? So if you look at this... Um, Carefully, uh, well, you know, with a little more detail, you'll notice that you know 
with, with um, acoustics, we work with uh, spectrograms mostly when we humans analyze things. And if you look at the, if you compare an image to a spectrogram, they both have a width component, they both have a height component. And there's almost always something in that frame that's readily identifiable and sometimes distinguishable when there are other things as well. Um, and so if computer vision industry has succeeded in you know, applying this kind of automatic recognition, in another, in another sense, um, object detection in a frame, we can easily adopt that to uh, using bio, to apply to applications in bioacoustics. Um, now you might be thinking um, audio files can be half a second long, half a minute long, couple of hours long, or sometimes half a day long or more. Um, how do you deal with the time component when you deal with CNNs? Um, we'll get to that in a second, but the long story short, it's uh, we, bas we basically break down the audio in smaller chunks that we can um, um, handle uh, more in a more manageable way. All right, so um, here's, here's a general generic workflow of how um, machine learning works for applications in bioacoustics. Um, for computer vision techniques, you know, you prepare the data, not necessarily um, much preparation is required because the image is an image, you know, it's already there. Um, but for bioacoustics, you basically need to transform the data, transform the audio, time domain audio into a two-dimensional representation, um, such as a spectrogram, before it can be fed into a model um, for either training or inference making. Um, So going back to what I just uh, talked about in terms of um, you know how how do you prepare the data for um, for acoustic problems? Um, here's an example um, of how I chose to do things. You know some of some some other folks may be doing things differently. Um, the example here shows um, a, a segment of a, a of a recording containing North Atlantic right whale calls. This is um, from the this is an example from the data set that you're going to work on eventually. Um, so the boxes there are basically the human annotations. Um, you know, all of these are done using Raven, basically. Um, so for preparing these as inputs to a model, we basically break them down into successive chunks. You know, you can have um, chunks with or without overlap. You can define how much overlap you want based on the problem that you're looking at. Um, notice that how some of these chunks have an annotation completely contained within the chunk. Some of them don't, some of them have partial overlaps with an annotation. Um, for purpose of training a model to learn to, you know, to learn to say whether or not a clip has a call in them, um, we want to assign labels to all of these clips. And the way I do that is basically saying everything, every clip that fully contains or you know, contains a, an annotation, a significant portion of an annotation, I'll label them as positive class labels. You know, in this case, you know, we're looking at a binary detector, you know, presence absence. So I'll just call this positive. If anything that has an annotation of a right whale call um, will be a positive, cl positive class clip. Anything that doesn't will be a negative class clip. And there are um, situations where there's some partial overlap. Um, these may be situations where you're only looking, you're only, the model is only able to look at a portion of call and this fragment of, of, of um, a signal that's present in that clip could be from something else. Um, so you don't, we don't wanna keep these for training um, so that the model, is, that way the model only has, you know, what it needs to learn things better. Um, getting into solving a problem, um, I, I would recommend that you start thinking of, um, the problem space as um, a set of parameters, a group of parameters, basically. And so I've color coded these um, for the different steps in the process, so you can actually remember them. The ones in green are basically things that you can do to make uh, make sure that the data is presented well to the models for consumption. And um, the one in blue is basically where you decide you know, how how can I design this model? What kind of model can be good for, for my application? And again, um, the last the last one is the training hyper hyperparameters, where you basically um, need to choose a set of values that will make the learning more effective. Um, we'll get to these steps um, eventually, but yeah, just think of a problem when you have a problem to solve. Think of it in terms of these three groups of uh, parameters. Um, all right, so I'm stepping aside for a for for, for a moment here. Um, most of you have uh, are familiar with the BirdNet app. That's you know that's available an app that's available on your phone. So you can just go out in the in the wild, um, hold up your phone, record, and you know it'll tell you what birds are there. 
Um, I'm not referring to the app itself here, but the um, underlying um, um, workhorse in that app, which is the Bernard algorithm. Um, this is, you know, it, it's an engineering feat essentially. So it can recognize over 5,000 species of birds. Um, it, you know, considers metadata, it considers your location and whatnot to give you a refined results and whatnot. Um, so if you think of, a machine, a bioacoustic machine learning uh, problem uh, in terms of a loosely defined term called a problem space that considers what kind of, how many species that you look at, how, what kind of your, what's the size of your data set, um, what kind of complexity does your model have, um, does it utilize all the resources efficiently, you know, if, it, if something takes a week to train, um, that kind of defeats the purpose. So, you need to think of all of these um, parameters. Um, so that basically defines your problem space. And looking at what BirdNet can do, um, you know, it's, it's a heavily, heavily complex model. It's a large problem space. So you can, if you think of a spectrum of problem spaces, you can push this to the, um, to the right extreme. And every other problem that we can think of can be seen as um, falling on the left of this, basically. So if you are an ecologist that, you know, basically has, six months of recording or a couple of years of recordings, and all you want to do is just recognize one species in there, you know, how many times it calls or what kind of calls it makes. Um, you're basically looking at a much pro smaller problem space. Um, and sometimes, you know, um, you, might, you might be looking at um, studying uh, behavioral dynamics or population dynamics and things like that. So you have a handful of species in the case. The, now, when, when it comes to actually implementing these problems, you know, you, it takes some effort level to actually solve all of these. And so in well, with BirdNet, if you think of how much effort has gone into it, it's been mostly designed by engineers and data scientists, you know, that are really experienced with these. So you can think of that problem level as, you know, setting a benchmark for us. Um, in comparison, if you have to go out and actually build your own models um, with the data that you have, you can think of that problem, uh, that effort level as, you know, being comparably that high. Um, sometimes you can get help with, um, say friends that are computer scientists or data scientists that can do this for you. Um, some of you might have um, collaborators in a computer science department and, you know, that can help things out. Um, but in cases where you don't have access to those people, your effort level shoots through the roof. Um, so that's where Google comes in, basically bring it down a notch. Yeah, maybe bring it down further, make it an equitable space. Um, Let's see how uh, you can actually go around using Google to solve these problems. So coming back to this phase, um, as I said, think of your problem as defined by three groups of parameters. Um, and here they are basically, you know, that's, that's all there is to um, think about the problem space. Um, so the first one here, the top one is basically you're defining how you want to transform time domain um, audio waveforms into a spectrogram or whatever, whatever any other, any other format uh, that might be suitable for the model. Um, I've filled in values here that are kind of optimal for the North Atlantic right whale. Um, if you, after we do the demo, if you want to adapt this example to solve a problem that you have, all you would need to do is basically change these parameters here. Um, this is where your domain knowledge comes into play. Um, so if you're looking at say a spe uh, you know a bird species, say a mountain chickadee, you would know um, what the average call length is, you know what the bandwidth is. So you can actually plug in those values here. That's basically your effort level, um, you know, that you bring in to solving this problem. And then when it comes to parameters that define the model architecture or the training process, um, you know, um, disclaimer. Here's the deal. So if you actually talk to a, a data scientist that has you know, five or 10 years worth of experience and ask them what are the best parameters that, that I can get here, likely you will get an answer that eh, maybe try this, maybe try that, I'm not sure, you'll have to experiment. Um, so don't feel bad if, you are, if you're not experienced with data science, you know, it, it's a learning process. Um, setting these parameters is, um, I would say, less science, more art. So you basically need to, need to get a feel for it. And uh, what Google does is basically help you um, run through this cycle very rapidly so that you can actually, um, you know, set a few parameters, change things around, you know, um, experiment quickly. Um, instead of spending six months developing something, there is a developed product. You can actually just change the parameters, um, 
train something quickly in, in an hour or in a couple of hours, um, experiment with a few models, choose the best model, and, you know, go on with solving your questions in ecology or biology at that point. Um, so now, um, you know, you, uh, I'm assuming you've come to a point where you can actually think of your problem space as, uh, you know, being defined by these uh, three problem, uh, these three uh, sets of parameters. All you need to do is plug in these into specific functions, three or maybe four functions in Kugu, and that's about it, um, as you'll see in the demo. Um, so before we go to the demo, I'd like to point out, um, you know, that there is this online documentation. Um, so all the things that you are gonna run through in the demo today, um, there's a lot more on this web page where you can actually um, um, get a better understanding of why some things are done in a certain way. And there are the parameters that, parameters that you can actually tweak um, to get uh, some slightly better performance. Um, I'm gonna share these links in chat as soon as I close the presentation, so don't bother um, taking screenshots now. All right, so um, time for the demo. Um, now, now would be a good time, you know, if you want to um, uh, change the Zoom uh, window to go, to go from full screen to, you know, turn that into a smaller screen. Um, because you'll be switching back and forth between a browser and this window. So if you can actually have the browser on one side um, and you know just shrink this Zoom window to a manageable size so you can actually see th read things off the screen. Um, all right, so I'm assuming folks have um, followed the instructions that were shared in the PDF file that Laurel had sent out. Um, if you haven't um, set up the data set in your Google Drive yet, um, Take a moment to do this. Um, so I think we have a couple of couple of minutes to spare here. So if you're at this, um, you know, I can wait for a couple of minutes. And if anybody has questions, I can take them. Sham, when you go back to um, unshared screen, people might have lost the link if they're trying to install. If you can drop that in the chat, maybe. Yeah, on it. So that's the link to um, get the data linked in your Google Drive. You're not necessarily copying it into your Google Drive. You know, it, it's, it's on the cloud. You're basically making a link to it from your Google Drive. All right, assuming you're all set up there, here's another link um, that you would need to go to to start this process. All right, so once you're on that uh, link, the Kugu demo link, um, if you have never used Collaboratory before, um, you will see something like this on the on the left here. Um, it's basically saying, you know, how to open this open this um, program. Um, if this is what you're seeing, the open with option, click on connect more apps and then search for Collaboratory. Uh, be sure that you know there's only single L in this. It's spelled with a single L. There's no two Ls in Collaboratory. So once you find that, go ahead and install it. Um, again, you're not installing anything on your computer. Um, what this installation means is that it's just that you're setting up your Google Drive um, to be able to run collaboratory um, app on it. Assuming that was done, um, or you know, assuming you had um, um, access to collaboratory before, you would see something like this instead, where it says open with Google collaboratory. Um, click on that and it'll open um, in a new tab. At this point, let's switch to this as well. So um, can you guys see the browser on my screen? Yes. All right, so if you're here at this point, uh, basically click on that. Um, notice this uh, message here, it says changes will not be saved. And so basically you have just opened my copy of this program. So what you need to do is click on this copy to drive. 
it's near the top left. Um, click on that and that'll create a copy of it in your Google Drive. Um, it might prompt you to open a new tab, um, go through with it. So once you're on that page, um, notice towards the top right, there's this option saying connect. Um, that's basically saying, you know, there are virtual machines running on the cloud. Um, you basically want to connect to one of those to run these programs. So go ahead and click connect there. All right, so now basically you're, um, you have an environment where you can actually run this program. Um, so what this program is basically, it's just a collection of, uh, um, you know, lines of code broken into groups, um, you know, that you can actually read and then uh, uh, you can read the instructions of what this, uh, what a particular group of uh, lines of, like group of lines of code does, um, execute them and then look at the results and then go further, execute the next group. Um, so if you move your mouse towards the top left, uh, towards the, yeah towards the left of each of these groups you'll see a play button and that's basically how you run uh, whatever code is in that cell go ahead and click play on the first one here so that will install the kubu package um, the one we'll be using for training a model and then it also installs the matplotlib which we'll basically use for uh, visualizing how well the training has performed um, that should complete quickly. Um, and then go on and click play on the next one. This cell is basically um, asking you permission to connect your Google, uh, to connect collaboratory to access your Google Drive. Um, go ahead and say yes to that. It will walk you through a prompt, um, you know, go through that and say hello. So once your Google Drive is mounted, um, you should be able to see the contents of that demo data directory. There we go, um, ran through on mine. I'll wait a minute if um, others are still waiting on this one. Um, while we wait, uh, let me just walk you through uh, what's coming up. So basically, as I said, you know, thinking of your problem uh, in terms of the groups of parameters, three groups of parameters that you want to deal with, and there are three or four functions that you feed these parameters into, we're just basically loading all of those um, functions here, um, and then you'll define the parameters later. Go ahead and click play on this cell, so all the modules are loaded. Um, all right, so that's good. So now this is where we define the data settings parameter. Notice also that there's a prepared audio directory. So um, once the data is prepared, um, Google stores them on the drive um, so that it can be used. Uh, so, you, so you don't have to re-prepare every time you train a model. You, you have this prepared data set once and you can keep training different models and see you know which of those models do better. So um, that's a, that, you know, data preparation is just a, um, independent step of from model training. Go ahead and click this, click play on this one. Uh, there's nothing to run. It's basically setting up these variables here. Um, the actual workload is here. Um, so, um, you know, if you click on the drive on the files icon here, it'll show you your, your Google Drive. Um, you can go down to say where your Google demo data is. You'll see that you know I've organized the training and test audio in separate folders here. Um, in this cell, all I'm doing is pointing to the right directories. I'm telling, I'm going to tell Kugu um, where the audio files are, where the annotation files are, and then I'm also giving a map of saying which files correspond to which, uh, which audio files correspond to which annotation files. So once you set that up, you basically feed those in along with the parameters that you have chosen. And then um, you know start preparing the data basically. So go ahead and click play on this. Um, this is gonna take a couple of minutes to run. Um, I'm gonna quickly ask you know is um, are people able to follow this through? Is it hard too hard switching back and forth between the screen and um, you know running things on your browser? Um, if so, let me know. I can slow down.
No complaints. If you have a question too and get stuck somewhere, feel free to put up a, a little virtual hand and we can get to you that way also. Um, Ina, um, you go ahead and unmute yourself. Can you tell me what the problem is? So I was able to install the app, but I haven't figured out how to bring up the same interface that you had where it says, welcome to collaboratory. Uh, okay, so on your screen, you might have seen something like this. Is that the case? Unfortunately, no. <laughs> um, are you logged into Google? Yes, and if I go to open with, it says connect more apps. Yeah, um, so when you say connect more apps, you have to search for collaboratory there. And then I install it, but for some reason it's not updating. It's not adding that to the open with list. Um, just um, maybe refresh the page. Yeah, at this point, let me um, clarify a few things. So, you know, when you think about solving the problems here, um, you, know, you know, the recogn automatic recognition um, um, of calls in, in long recordings, um, there are very many components that, you know, come into play. Um, one of the things is basically writing that program to actually solve that problem. Um, the other is to setting up the environment where you can actually run these programs. Um, now, you know, if you are capable of actually setting up a Python environment on your own computer. Um, it's all, you know, um, things should be pretty straightforward from there on for you. Um, because, you know, uh, things are diff things differ between Windows machine or a Mac computer or a Linux computer, things like that. I haven't actually included any of those instructions here, um, which is why I chose to do this demo on Google Collab, which is basically a platform where all of those packages are actually installed, you know, the, um, um, GPU drivers are are, are pre-installed, so you don't have to deal with you don't have to worry about setting those up. Um, yeah, um, so I'm hoping Athena it worked for you at this point. Yes, yes, thank you. All right, so coming back to the screen, so you'll see that the um, data preparation step should have finished by now. Um, I have this code at the bottom which says basically says you know print out how many clips I could find for each class. Um, so that's the count that we have. So if you look at the um, the data set that's here, that's this is basically I'm just I'm only giving a a small subset of what's part of a a larger challenge data set that's available on the internet. Um, so it basically has four days of data set aside for training and other, another three days of data set aside for testing. Um, just for speed, um, you know, getting through this uh, presentation quickly, I'm only considering one day here. I've blanked out the remaining three days. So, uh, you know, things run quickly. When, when you have time subsequently, you can actually uncomment those lines and run these for, over the whole data set. And these, Sean, quick question. Um, uh -huh. These are annotations that were manually annotated. So this is your validation data set, right? Oh, I wouldn't call it validation. It's manually annotated to build a training set, basically. Okay. Okay. So, so if as we I were showed this, um, earlier, just double checking that this is where the the data that you're hundred percent sure of goes. Yeah. Um. So. So yeah. Thanks for catching that, Michelle. Um, so there's um, one thing I've actually forgot to mention. Um, so there are um, situations where you know you have done immense amount of work and labeled every single call present in a training data set. Um, you know this is living in an ideal world, but that's not almost always the case, right? So you you know there's chance that you might actually miss a few here and there. Um, but this example data set is one where we have quite some confidence that almost every call that there is in the recording has been annotated which is why um, I basically chose the positive class positive uh, class clips to be those that contained um, an annotation in them and everything else that wasn't annotated, all the time durations that weren't annotated, we can safely consider those as the negative class, which is basically what I'm specifying here, saying, you know, consider everything that's not annotated as a negative class, which is one of the reasons why we have 
a very large uh, negative sample set here. Um, so when you adopt this to your own problem, um, you know, your own uh, data set, if you do not have all of the calls annotated, um, you might want to explicitly choose some regions and annotate them as a negative class. So that way you don't have to specify this negative class equals other uh, parameter. Um, and the, the, the pre-processing stage will actually take those sections uh, labeled as other and build the negative class data set from there. Did that answer your question, Michelle? Yes, absolutely. That's a, that exactly answers my question. All right. Um, so moving on. Um, so now that you so basically we've you know broken down the audio into smaller clips and saved them to drive. Um, now we need to figure out a way to actually feed those into the model uh, for consumption. Um, so one of the things that uh, Google offers is this um, spectral data feeder. It basically um, um, transforms the time domain signal into a spectrogram on the fly while feeding into the spectro you know, uh, while feeding into the training pipeline. Um, go ahead and click play on this. Um, it doesn't really output anything right now. Um, it's just setting up that object. Um, notice some of the parameters here. Um, so, you know, for most uh, machine learning problems, you would generally set up about you, know, you would you would generally set aside about fifteen percent of your training samples for validation um, because we are we are dealing with a smallish data set here. I'm only using ten percent of those. Um, and just to speed things up for this demo, I've actually capped the number of samples that we consider in training to 1,500 samples per class. You know, 1,500 positive, 1,500 negative. Um, if you notice, you know, the positive class has less than 1,500, so that's okay. Um, but of the um, you know 150,000 samples that are there for the negative class, I'm only going to use 15, 1,500 here. Um, you know, after this um, presentation, you can actually go back and change this number and um, try a higher number and see. Um, it, it's most likely going to improve your model a little, um, but let's just stick, stick with this for now. All right, so you have prepared the data, you have set up a feeder. Now all there is is basically to um, define what kind of model you want, um, you know, say where the model needs to be, where, say where a trained model needs to be stored define what your training parameters are. Remember, there's still two sets of parameters that we haven't dealt with yet. One is the parameter, the model choice, and then is the training choice. I have filled in some defaults here that will kind of work mostly well for now. Um, we'll keep stick with those. And once you know those variables are set, you basically call the train function and feed all of those parameters in. Go ahead and click play. Um, so this will basically, spit out uh, the model configuration um, you know in a in a nicer way basically um, and then it will start training um, so we have currently set up this process to train for 30 epochs that's basically you know the, the entire training set um, the model runs through the whole data set once that's one epoch um, it'll iteratively keep refining its parameter its weight so it actually um, you know arrives at an optimal solution and so it repeats this whole epoch 30 times in this example um, you know, when you adapt this problem to your, uh, when you adapt this program to solve your problem, you can change this around. Notice how through the training process, the uh, training loss is decreasing gradually. You might see fluctuation here and there, but the general direction must be that the loss should decrease and the accuracy should increase. If that's not happening, that's when you realize, you know, you've got either bad data set or you have uh, bad training parameters. So you've got to tweak one of those. Um, let me point out at this time, you know, what, something that I was talking about earlier is the fact that, you know, Kugu um, basically stresses through and, you know, utilizes all the computational resources that you have. Um, so you can actually train, you can train models very rapidly. As you can see, you know, this model basically takes about a minute or two to train. Um, so if imagine, you know, with, with this kind of speed, you can actually change parameters and train, you know, a few dozen different models um, before you actually get to solving your ecology or biology question. Um, you have a bunch of models that you, you can compare the performance of these and pick the best model and just go with it. All right, so 
I'm assuming the training has finished for most of you. Um, this graph kind of basically shows what you can actually see in numbers above, right? Um, you can see that the accuracy, the red line is for the training, the green line is for um, validation. You can see that the accuracy for both um, is kind of going up generally and the loss is dropping as well. Uh, yeah, Michelle, the lines need not be identical. Um, basically, when the model starts training, um, it, it it's the model is initialized with some random weights. The random weights may be different for you. So, how uh, where the model gets to, um, uh, how the model gets to it is not really important. But the general idea is that the accuracy should go up, the loss should drop. The, keep an eye on just, just that those trends basically. Um, at this point, um, let's say you know right click on that image and you know either save that image or open in a new tab. Um, I'll show you a quick tweak that you can do in parameter settings. We'll train a different model, and then we can compare uh, the performance of these two models. So go ahead and click open a new tab on that image. So there you have it there. Now let's go back. Is um, Everybody up to speed or should, should I wait for some now? Wendy, um, I think the error you're talking about, so that's, you probably have an older version of code, the categorical, categorical accuracy. So I've actually, the new version actually changes it to binary accuracy. Um, so you should have the new code. We can talk about this later um, offline if you want. All right, so I'm assuming everybody has trained the first model here. Uh, let's scroll back up to where you define the model, model parameters. Um, notice that, um, I have comment, commented out a line here. It says add batch norm equals true. Go ahead and uncomment that. So this is a neat trick, uh, you know, machine learning jargon again. Um, I won't go into details, but think of it as, uh, you know, normalizing things as data progresses through a model. Um, so that actually helps the model converge on an optimal solution uh, better. Um, so once you um, uncomment that line, go ahead and click play again. So we'll retrain a model with these new values now, or you know, with this new flag turned on. Um, again, disclaimer. So how a model trains, you know, how a model gets to the uh, final, um, um, uh, final accuracy um, that kind of depends on how well they were initialized to begin with you know how the random random initialization happens um so you you know you may not get the same curves that i see here um and when we compare the outputs of this model to the previous model um i'm hoping that you know this model actually does better there's fair chance that you know sometimes it may not do better uh, but adding batch normalization in a general sense actually does improve uh, the training process. So let's see how that goes. I'm just gonna bring this to a side so we can do a side-by-side -side comparison. Oh, Dimitri, you're actually ahead of me. <laughs> All right, so you can compare things now, um, basically. Um, so you see that the uh, training loss was a little higher um, in the previous model. It's actually gone further down. Um, the validation loss probably stayed about the same, uh, but at least you, know, you can be guaranteed that the model um, has learned something better in this case. Um, when you, um, after this demo, if you want to play around further, I would recommend that you go up 
and um, change the max um, samples per class to be a little higher, you know, set it to say 3,000 or 5,000 and try it out. Um, that should actually give you um, an even better model at that point. And so at this point, you know, you should really think of the trade-off here. So if you have way too many samples going into your model for training, it's going to take longer, uh, but you'll get a better model. So, you know, you want speed versus you want, um, you know, better accuracy, um, you can play around um, based on what kind of requirements you have for solving the problem. All right, so now that we have a trained model, something that's decent, um, Kubo also offers you know, a way to rapidly use these, you know, in a batch processing mode. Um, so if you have, once you have a reasonable, uh, a decent model that you've trained, um, you can just take that model and run it on years worth of recordings um, at a very high speed, basically. And so the first um, run here of using the model will basically just run this on a single file. Notice how I just have a path to a single file here. Um, and I'm saying, you know, where the detections need to be um, put out as well. Go ahead and click play on this. Um, yeah, it basically finishes in no time. You can compare the, uh, you know, you, you can test the speed of this one. If you essentially delete everything that's about a, just the file name and instead point the test audio to a directory, um, so this directory has, um, uh, as I said, you know, it's a whole days of recording. So there's the files are split into 15 minute um, um, pieces. So there's about 96 files. Um, you know, it's again, 24 hours recording. So once you delete that file name from the path, go ahead and click play again. Um, we'll just, we'll see that you know, it, it basically takes not much time to actually process uh, all of these files. Um, so once you know, once when you when you adopt this uh, example to solve your problem, you, know, you can have an iterative um, loop where you basically uh, change the model parameters and retrain. You can also include um, a performance assessment within that loop. So you train your model, you assess the performance. If you're not satisfied, go back, change things, and you know repeat the whole process basically. Um, I have not included the performance assessment code here. Um, but again, if you go back to that link I shared where there's online documentation, that includes a more thorough example, which actually puts the performance assessment also in the loop. Um, you can try that out um, at a later time. All right, so basically we, the model was able to process um, you know, 24 hours of recording in about 20, in less than 20 seconds in this case. Um, now, mind you, um, you know, you're running everything on the cloud. It doesn't mean that you have the best infrastructure there. Um, if you look at details of what Google offers you in collaboratory, when you're, you know, at least when you're using the free account, which is what I'm doing right now, um, it sure it gives you a machine with a C, with a GPU on it. Um, but the number of computer cores, the CPU cores that's there, it's either just one or two cores. So it's not really you know, um, that great of a system. If you have a laptop that has you know, one of the modern um, Pentium processors on it, chances are you have you know, eight cores or 16 cores on it. And if you have even the modest GPU on it, your laptop is way better than you know, this virtual machine that's being provided to us. So, um, if you process all of these on your laptop, things will go even faster there. And so um, with that, you know, I pretty much um, have come to the end of this demo. Um, the drive home message here is that, you know, um, not to be intimidated with all the jargon that goes into machine learning and whatnot. Um, you don't have to write too much code. All you have to do is, you know, think of your um, ecology question or your biology question in terms of three parameter groups. Um, address those and plug those into three or four functions, and boom, you can have your uh, your own trained models. All right, happy to take questions now. Hey, Ross. Hey, Sham. That was great. It was really cool um, interactive uh, demo. Very and uh, never used. Uh, Google Colab before it's great 
environment. Um, so one question is when you um, run this on real data as you just did at the end, um, what happens to the output? Is it generating Raven selection tables to put somewhere or what? Uh, yeah, sorry, I forgot to mention that. <laughs> Thanks for the question. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so the uh, currently Google uh, spits out everything as selection table. So again, if you look at the uh, directory tree here, um, so there was the Google demo data directory, which contain all of the uh, training and the test sets. Um, there's a new date, new folder that's created called Google demo, which is basically where my intermediate clips are stored, the prepared data, the uh, data, the model files are stored basically, um, you yeah. know, you, all your model um, model specific files are there. The train model is basically there. And then um, as we set out this detections directory, that sits here. And so you have, uh, from the first run, you have one file um, only, but from you know, the second run, you basically ran through all of the files. So there's one selection table file per audio file. Um, you can quickly open them up and check them here. You know, so there's the start time, end time, and the label associated with it, and there's a score given to it as well. Um, you know, you, um, we have only chosen to output anything that had a score of 0.75 or above. Um, so that's all you see there. Um, so this additional option here where it says combine outputs equals true, uh, which is commented out in this example, but you can uncomment that. And that spits out Raven selection tables in a different format where you have one selection table file for all the files contained in a folder. Um, that becomes a lot, lot more easier, a lot more tractable when you're actually opening all of these audio files in Raven for um, you know, downstream validation efforts. Dimitri, um, Dimitri asks, do CPUs matter more than GPUs? Um, well, hard question to say yes or no, but I'll answer in a longer form. Um, GPU uh, is vital for training these models. You know, a lot of the number crunching for op optimizing the models uh, happens on the GPU a lot faster than, you know, several orders of magnitude faster than they can happen on the CPU. But the way Kugu is designed is that it let the model uh, number crunching happen on the GPU while um, it'll utilize every CPU that we have for preparing the data so that the GPU isn't waiting for more input data. You know, once it's finished a batch or you know, a few inputs, um, it usually, um, it's it usually the um, preparation of data that takes time. So Google basically maxes out on utilizing all the resources available on the computer. Um, so that way your GPU is not held waiting for data. Um, yeah. Athena asks, how can you run it on a laptop um, with data on a hard drive? Um, as I said, you know, um, there's a lot of bells and whistles that go into setting up an environment. Um, you know, the primary hurdle is basically setting up your, uh, installing GPU drivers, uh, CUDA drivers to, um, utilize the GPU. Um, if you don't have a GPU card, it's a lot straightforward, but if you have a GPU and want to use it, um, it takes a little effort. Um, you know, if, if you don't have too much computer science background, you can ask a friend to do this. It's gonna be a one-time setup. Once that's set up, you know, you can start training models uh, as you go. Um, yeah, for that, that was the reason for this demo I actually chose to run it on, um, on uh, Colab so we don't have so we don't you know, waste time learning how to set up an environment. So when working with students, I have two questions. Would you recommend generally that this is, and I'm thinking about some of my students who are not as code savvy, that sticking with trying to do it in the Google environment using Collab is probably the best way to streamline that process for them. And is there, and, and the answer to this is probably not, but is there a sort of a user's guide available to step through new users? So when we wanna try and play with this on our own, we don't have to keep bugging you. Yeah, so the online documentation, that actually gives you a lot more description of each you know, step through this process, right? Okay. Uh, so, you know, 
again, you know, there, there's setting up the environment to do the do things and actually doing the things on this environment. Um, for setting up the environment, um, I am currently working on, uh, you know, adding links to where you can actually do this, uh, set up yourself. Um, but the best resource, I think, would be to look at the TensorFlow website. Uh, mm -hmm. Just type that address here. Yeah, tensorflow.com. So if you go there, um, uh, somewhere on that website, there is a link um, describing how to set up your environment to use GPU. Um, but yeah, to um, answer your other question um, about um, you know shared access working, um, running things on your local computer, uh, and if you're working with the team, you know all of everybody in the team would need access to this data if they're doing training on their own ends. Um, so if you have data on a local network, that works. Um, but if you have uh, you know, a more manageable, smallish size data set, it might actually just make sense to leave everything on the cloud. That way you can actually grant access to all your collaborators to the data. Um, and they can, once the data is already on the, on, on the drive, on, on, on the cloud, um, you, know, you don't need to share things around, you basically, as, as we did in, in this demo, you basically uh, create a link from your Google account to whatever that shared 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 uh, folder is, and you know um, just run uh, collab on that basically. Great, thank you, Sham. Sham, can I ask a question about the parameters that are toggleable in the model architecture section? Mm -hmm. So you have. Um, these three values in a vector, and I see that they relate to the size of the output um, of the different kind of like, you know, layer chunks. Could you tell us a little bit about how changing those values will change the performance of the model, like some intuitive understanding of what changing those values will do for us? Intuitive, that's something you know, that <laughs> had asked me before. <laughs> um, so interpretable uh, machine learning, then we're not kind of there yet. Um, but you know the general gist is that the deeper the model is, you know, general understanding is that the deeper the model is, the better it does. Um, but the deeper the model is, the more complex it becomes. You know, it takes up a lot of resources to train and whatnot. So the shallower it is, uh, you can actually train faster. You can experiment faster. Um, so you find that trade-off basically you know, after you played around with a few. Um, in terms of what things hap what happens inside is basically uh, up to the architecture as well. Um, so this example uses the very very basic convolutional neural network. You know, one of the early forms of neural networks. Um, there's ResNet, there's DenseNet, there's InceptionNet, whatnot. Uh, I'm yet to implement the ResNet in Kubu, but there's a DenseNet implementation which uh, you might find a little more interpretable than ConNet. So if we were to add another value into that vector, would we get another chunk of these um, convolution, normalization, relu, and pooling layers? We could deepen the network by adding Yeah, so in, in the... this example, you know, there's three values in that array. Um, so you know, you're basically saying three blocks and that many filters per block. So if you add another value there, that will add another block and that many filters in that block. Okay, so number of... Yeah, so number one, of, you know, one of the things, one of the blocks. design goals for Kubu was basically not have you an ecologist you know, write all that code to build a, to you know, construct a model. Um, all you have to do is just basically change parameters and it'll, that'll actually build the model structure for you. Thanks. I got a quick question. So how, how do you sort of avoid overfitting or that kind of thing? Yeah, deeper questions. Yeah, so that's again, you know, falling into that science versus arts uh, realm. Um, you basically have to play around. So um, overfitting, you can avoid some overfitting. Again, let me take us back to this uh, demo. Um, so there's a parameter. There's a few things that you can do to avoid overfitting. Um, you know, in the train settings, you can say. You can add a dropout rate. Um, so that basically um, helps the model generalize a lot better um, rather than you know, really memorizing um, uh, the few given representations of a call. 
Um, so there's other forms of regularization that you can add where you can change the learning rate. That's also a parameter that you can you know, add to um, um, the training settings. Um, yeah, now if, if you look at the uh, the documentation uh, link that I shared, all of these parameters are actually de defined there. So you can pick and choose what you want. Um, you can pick and choose uh, what values you want to add to these as well. Um, so there are a few tricks that you can use. Um, just for the sake of you know clarity if for people that are training for the first time, I chose to keep those settings away. Um, you know, just take a very basic sample in this in this demo. So yeah, long story short, there's you know, if you get into the concepts of machine learning, there are way too many things that you can actually configure. Um, the default, the basic example should work for most people, you know, that have a very simple problem to solve, one call type, you know, um, not many variations, things like that, or you know, just a handful of calls. Um, but if you know what for folks that understand some concepts of machine learning, programming, they can actually dig deeper and you know tweak a lot more parameters to actually um, achieve whatever they want, basically. Um, Russ asks, what changes when we go to more classes? So um, when you go to more classes, you basically, you know, again, so you don't have, uh, I've designed Google in such a way that you don't have to deal with the model parameterization when it comes to adding more classes. So as long as you have those classes specified in the annotation tables in the data preparation phase, um, all of those classes are written out in the prepared data and whatever classes are available uh, before training in that prepared data set, those are the number of classes that will, that the model will be capable of dealing with. So you don't have to explicitly specify how many classes you want. Um, as long as things are there in the annotation set, um, you know, uh, just basically run those three, four functions and you're, you're good. Any final questions for Xiang? This is super easy. Is it possible to reference data on box? I think you can. I haven't tried it myself, but then you know, if you're training on your local computer with data that's sitting on box, you know, that all that you know, several gigabytes of data is basically going back and forth uh, over the network. That's definitely going to slow things down. But it's another. possible. I did have another question. Um, so does the training data have to be the same, like the same sample rate, et cetera, as your, your the actual um, data? Not I mean, necessary. Um, yeah, Cause I was thinking like, you know, if you downloaded something from like Zeno Canto or something like that. Then yeah, you... uh, of course, yeah. Um, so um, one of the things that we do, um, again, um, going back to the parameters, um, here, so you can basically specify if you want to downsample or you know, upsample or whatever everything and all the files in the data set. So if you're collecting data across many years, you know, gathering data from different data collection activities, um, you basically want to normalize all of those to a given uh, to a you know fixed sampling rate. So that's the parameter that you set um, in the you know in the in the training settings in the in the data settings basically, and so Google automatically resamples everything as necessary, um, if necessary, if the audio file is not already in that format. Um, so you don't have to explicitly deal with um, um, twiddling around your files or you know, resampling your files yourself. Very cool, thank you, Sham. I, I have a couple data sets sitting around that I'm super keen to try this on. I'm sure I'll have more questions as I try it myself, but I've seen it work impressively well for Panama Katie did, so. Yeah, yeah I hope um, most of you got through the demo. Um, yeah, I'm, uh, it, it's somewhat straightforward um, to adapt this to um, you know, simpler problems that you may have, um, but if you, you know, encounter issues, do feel free to reach out to us. Awesome. Thank you so much. I hope you all have a good week. Thanks, everyone. Um, just as a heads up, our next meeting will be off schedule. The presenter is in Australia, and there's no way that it's a comfortable time um, 
if we were at 10 30 in the morning for them it's you know like 1 30 in the morning for them so i will be sending out an email with details of that session um, but look forward to talking with you all take care and have a great week see everyone